New Forest. Oh, lovely. Welcome. Where else is everybody from? I can see a lot of you are coming in now. South Wales. Anyone from overseas? We've got quite a Scottish contingent. Two of our speakers are from Scotland as well. Just looking to see uh, how many more people are coming in before I get started. Sunny Suffolk, is it really sunny in Suffolk? Well, that's amazing um, because it's been raining here for most of the week, really. California. Did I see? Excellent. Oh, and another one, Los Angeles. So yeah, we've got some people from overseas. Welcome everybody. How exciting. Right, let's see what the time is. Um, okay, let's get going. And then um, the lovely Emily who's helping me will uh, bring, let anyone else in along the way. So welcome. Oh, welcome from Sheffield. That's absolutely great, loads of you. Um, right, well, first things first, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Jackie Lynch. I am a registered nutritional therapist. I'm your host for tonight. And uh, just a little bit of information about me. I'm a registered nutritional therapist. My Well, Well, Well Nutrition Clinic specializes in women's health and the menopause. And everything I do is around supporting uh, the menopause from a diet and lifestyle perspective. Um, I run loads of uh, talks and workshops and webinars like today, and I'm the author of this wonderful book, um, fully branded with background here in my lounge, The Happy Menopause, Smart Nutrition to Help You Flourish. Um, I'm also the host of the Happy Menopause podcast, which if you haven't come across, I urge you to listen to, because each month I have a different special guest who comes to join me to talk about a specific aspect of the menopause. And in fact, all three brilliant guests tonight um, actually are um, have been on the podcast as well. So if you want to find out more about them and listen to a whole half hour of them talking um, in full detail, then you can do that as well. Now, um, I think we've got a slide about the prize draw. So let's bring that up now because we've got an amazing prize draw for all of you to enjoy. Um, and simply by being here tonight, you are automatically um, entered. So I'd like to give a huge thank you, first of all, to Better You um, for their lovely prize, which is a fantastic box of some great magnesium flakes, magnesium sleep lotion, a, uh, a magnesium joint spray, and also wonderful, in fact, here's one I prepared earlier that I never leave home without, which is the vitamin D spray and um, a B, vitamin B12 spray as well. And then the wonderful Silk Natural, who've uh, put together a fabulous intimacy pack with some, some of their amazing vaginal moisturizer, along with a little bit of stuff to get you in the mood with um, uh, a little bit of fizz and some chocolates, which is amazing. Um, and then uh, thank you to Watkins, my publisher, who've included my book and my other book, The Right Bite, you can see on there, which are all part of the prize draw. So stick around to the end, because um, as long as you're still with us, you'll automatically enter into the prize draw. So um, that'll be fun. So what I'd like to do now is bring up all my uh, lovely guests so you can see who's here tonight so, and they can give a quick uh, wave to you all. Um, so we've got, uh, just check that I've got the right view on. Yay, there's Christine. Um, so Christine Bird, pelvic health physiotherapist, will be talking to us. We've also got Claire, Dr. Claire McCauley, who's an oncologist and sex coach talking all about libido in a few minutes. And um, our first speaker of the night who hasn't popped up yet on the um, pin is Ruth Devlin. Oh, here she is. And she's a nurse and health coach. So um, first things first, we're going to be talking to 
each of these, we're going to have, they'll have a 10 minute slot where we'll be running through some key questions around vaginal health, pelvic floor and libido. Um, so we'll be running through a 10 minute session with each of those. And then we're going to open up the floor. So if you've got any um, questions, pop them in the chat, because when we get to the panel session, I'll be running through the questions. And it's your opportunity really to ask these amazing experts everything you want to know about their specialist area. So let's crack on. Um, if Christine and, and Claire, you can pop your cameras off. Um, I would like to tell you all about Ruth Devlin. Uh, now, Ruth Devlin is a nurse and a health coach. She's also a clinical educator specializing in the menopause, and she is the author of the excellent book, Men, Let's Talk Menopause. And that's a snappy and useful guide to help the men in our life really understand what's going on with menopause. So if, um, if you want to share that with your, your, the men in your life, go for it, because it's a really great book. Um, I recorded uh, the Happy Menopause podcast episode with Ruth back in March this year on the perimenopause, and it's actually ended up to be uh, the, one of the most popular ones I've done in the entire four seasons. So do listen in um, if you want to hear a bit more about Ruth and her expertise from there, because it's absolutely amazing. So, right, without further ado, let's bring Ruth up onto the screen and uh, get going with our questions. We've got um, 10 minutes and we're bang on time, which I'm very excited about. So, Ruth, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you very much. And thanks very much for that lovely introduction. Gosh, I didn't know where to put myself. There we go. <laughs> well, you're a star in the menopause firmament, so we're really lucky to have you here. Um, before we drill down into the whole business of vaginal health, dryness, mm. TIs, and everything else I want to ask you about, I thought we'd just start with the basics because there's a lot of confusion about the actual anatomy of down mm. below. So tell us, Ruth, what's the difference between a vagina and a vulva? Yeah, so lots of confusion and lots of people have have um, little names as well for their nether regions as well as <laughs> other nether regions, fee fee, foo foo, whatever. But basically, your vagina is the internal canal that goes from the, the opening of your womb, the neck of the womb, the cervix, to the vaginal opening. And then the vulva, that's your external organs, your external genitals, and that includes your labia, that includes your clitoris, and the vaginal opening and also the urethra opening where you pee out of. That's basically it. Yeah. yeah. But nobody talks about the vulva. They always just talk about the vagina and they say, oh, that's, you know, if, if somebody like me, they might just say, oh, well, I'm going to look at my vagina. Well, it's pretty hard without a speculum. So what you want to be looking at always is the vulva. Yeah. 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 I've heard the vulva described as the whole ham sandwich. Ooh. And it's a bit graphic, but it does kind of tell you what we're talking about there, doesn't it? It does. It's described in lots of different ways. Definitely lettuce leaves, all these sorts of things. Lots of uh, comical words, but yeah. So intimate health is a big issue when we come into the menopause. Mm. Why do women start to experience vaginal dryness? Well, a very good question. So when your estrogen levels start to decline and fluctuate, that has an impact on all those estrogen receptors throughout your body, and particularly in this area, because that has an, an, an effect on those glands which are producing the lubrication for your vagina. So the lubrication starts decreasing, and then that can result in the feelings of, you know, maybe irritation, you may be feeling dry. Um, and you can feel quite a lot of discomfort as well, particularly if you're, if you're having intercourse as well. It can feel quite sore. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, it's one of those issues that can really be behind painful sex um, mm. and uh, a contributor, I think, to what's going on with women's libido, which is something we'll be coming on to a bit later. Yeah. No, but definitely. I think one of the common things, of course, is that um, because you're itching down there, you mm. automatically often think, oh, is it thrush? No, no, definitely. And I think there's lots of misconceptions, aren't there, around this area? And I think you, you immediately think, gosh, I've got an infection or something like that. And I think if you know, if you understand more about why you're, why you're experiencing the symptoms, that, that can help an awful lot. So, and also that it's not your fault that you're experiencing these symptoms. I think that can be um, a good understanding as well. So knowing that estrogen levels are, de are declining and fluctuating are causing these symptoms and then symptoms like the irritation dryness soreness and also 
it affects the pH levels of your vagina. So if they become more alkaline, so that can make you more prone to infections like the fungal infections like thrush, but also urinary tract infections as well. Yeah, yeah. It's incredibly common, actually. Lots of women start mm. to experience them the much more often and don't really realize what's going on there. Mm -hmm. I think it's quite interesting because when you start to look at nutrition online and, and read bloggers and influencers, there's lots of fuss about having the so-called alkaline diet as if acidity mm. is a bad thing. But the vagina is actually naturally an acidic environment. Mm. And it's that acidity that actually protects you against these infections. So uh, yeah. drop in estrogen really can affect that. And it's one of the things that you know, we really need to be thinking about what can we do? Mm -hmm. So what can we do? How can we deal with these issues? Well, first of all, um, I just want, to, you know, before we go on to moisturizers and lubricants, first of all, I want to just say about basic hygiene. So you want to be avoiding heavily perfumed soaps, bath oils, um, you know, uh, bubble baths, things like that. And if you're particularly dry, if you're particularly sensitive in this area, then you want to be thinking about using an emollient soap or shower gel as well, something like Dermal 200, which can really help to protect, protect this area. And don't What's overwash. What's an emollient it, soap? What is so that? emollient, so that sort of helps, it helps um, protect and coat the lining of um, and the tissues and helps just moisturize as well so keeps helps to keep that moisture in so you can Where also can you buy those so you can buy those in um pharmacies yeah definitely anywhere or boots anywhere okay. like that yeah okay. yeah or you can buy it online so dermal 200 is one make and there's, there's lots of other makes as well but it's worth investing in that and then you have so you can use if you're in the shower you can use your normal shower gel for all the other areas of your body but then you can just use a simoleon shower gel for, for this area for the for um for the the vulva area as well so yeah it does make a big difference and also can i before i forget to say your vagina is self-cleaning so please don't go shoving anything up there like douches or anything like that no, oh, no. it's like you're just going to irritate it even more um but think about so think about that first of all and be you know be quite strict about that and then also think about um, what you're wearing. So tight clothing um, and synthetics, you know, that, that will aggravate the situation. So wear natural fibers, cotton and silks, really, really good. Um, and making sure that you, um, uh, that you, you think about using a moisturizing lubricant to start with, yeah. So what's the difference between a moisturizer and a lubricant? Okay, well, a lubricant is uh, more short acting. So that's for, you know, you'll, you'll use a lubricant for, you know, before intercourse or, and that won't, that won't last as long as the moisturiser. So the moisturiser is, the lubricant is there to lubricate just before you're, you're having intercourse, make it more comfortable. Um, and then the moisturiser is the longer lasting one too, and that gets absorbed more. I see. And would you use a moisturiser every day? Use it as little as often as you require, basically, I would say. I mean, something like silk, the moisturising lubricant there, that's ideal. You can use it as little or often as you like. And then you can use it in conjunction with, and we're going to talk about vaginal oestrogen as well. So it's quite safe to use it in conjunction with that. Maybe not exactly at the same time. So just so that they're, they're you know, both yeah, have you know, used efficiently, but, but not but together, yeah. Mm. And I know you can get water-based lubricants and oil-based mm. lubricants. What's mm -hmm. the difference? Yeah, I would go for a water-based lubricant, which is paraben-free, and you're wanting to look at them and, and check the pH level. So it should be between 4 and 4.5, you're wanting it um, to be. And then because you what, not, what you're not wanting it to do is in, to interfere with any... Um, with any um, contraception like like uh, condoms or anything like that, which right. could be affected by that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's talk vaginal estrogen. Yes. Aha. Now, <laughs> vaginal estrogen is just heaven, really. And if you talk to any pelvic health um, specialist, they would say, "Gosh, I, I would put, I'd put everybody on vaginal estrogen at the age of fifty, and which is why, thankfully." You know, throughout the pharmacies, we're going to be able to buy this over the counter, but we're just going to be able to buy one brand over the counter for now. So that's an important thing to explain because there's lots of different um, ways of having your vaginal estrogen. First of all, it's it's very different from systemic HRT. OK, it's very, very low systemic absorption because it's only 10 micrograms that you're that you're having and it's going exactly to where it's needed. So it has a really good effect. 
But before um, we go into different types, you just got to realize that because it's such a low level, it can take a wee while to work. So, you know, lots of people will say, oh, I tried that for two or three days. That was rubbish. Didn't help at all. No, no, no. You need to take you need to be using it for at least continuously for well, to start with for two weeks. And then you need, you know, some people don't feel the full effects till maybe three months down the line or even mm -hmm. six months down the line. Mm -hmm. So these, the gender union symptoms, they're your long-term symptoms. So you really have to think long-term the treatment, but you have to give this time to work. So you could have like a, um, a tablet, which is on the end of an applicator, um, something like uh, Vagifem, and then you've got, um, and you would use that continuously for two weeks and then you'd use it, you'd, you'd go on to maybe twice a week after that. And then you've, there's also gel that you could use. There's also cream or there's um, a silicone ring which gets inserted, um, which is impregnated with estrogen that gets inserted um, by a healthcare professional into your vagina and that gets replaced every three months and slowly. So if you're a little bit forgetful, that might be a good idea to have right. one of those popped in. Um, you, they should be very comfortable. You shouldn't be able to feel it. It shouldn't interfere with sexual intercourse. Um, and then that gets replaced every three months. So lots of different options. And I think that's the one important thing about, about you know, any ways to cope with menopausal symptoms is knowing all those different options available and then making that, you know, informed decision. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So mm. just quickly, because I'm conscious of time, yeah. um, when it comes to actually sort of getting hold of this, you can you can get it from your doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the thing to remember here is if you are getting recurrent instances of thrush or recurrent UTIs, the mm -hmm. answer might not be a full-on antifungal treatment or a full-on antibiotic treatment. Absolutely. If that's not really working, it could be that the hormonal treatment's what you need. Would that matter? Absolutely. Yeah, no, definitely. And it's not a known for um, many women in their postmenopausal years to have, you know, persistent um, U UTIs, urinary tract infections. And then when, when, once you're on like the third repeat prescription of antibiotics, you really need to be starting thinking, hang on a minute, something else is going on here. You yeah. know, that shouldn't be happening at all. Yeah. yeah. So having that so show rebalancing those hormone levels can have a remarkable effect. So Fantastic. Really, really good. Yeah. Ruth, thank you so <laughs> much information in a short time. And I've seen some interesting questions popping up in the chat. Okay. So we'll be sure to, to come back to those when we get to the panel session. But there okay. was one or two very specific ones. If you want to answer those directly in the chat, you're very welcome to do that as yes. well. Well, okay. thank you very much. Um, so talk. camera off for you and let's bring up uh, Christine's slide. Which is hopefully coming up any minute now. Um, I've seen in the chat at least three questions coming in around urgency and issues around pelvic floor. So stick around because we've got the wonderful Christine Bird, who's a chartered pelvic health physiotherapist and my absolute uh, menopause buddy. We've been presenting together for years now uh, on issues around the menopause. She's the founder of the excellent White Heart um, Multidisciplinary Clinic in Southwest London. And she's helped countless women um, dealing with issues around urinary stress incontinence, pelvic pain and leaking. And she's also the co-founder of Menopause Movement, which is an online community which provides uh, multidisciplinary training to health and fitness professionals who are looking to support women during the menopause. So she's just the woman we need. And I know she's got tons to say. So let's get rid of the slide and let's bring Christine up and crack on. Christine, thanks for joining us. Hi there. Hi. No, thanks for inviting. Thanks oh, for inviting. always a pleasure. Well, bodies, bodies we chat. are. <laughs> we <laughs> certainly are. So I know you've probably seen in the chat some of the questions coming up. Yeah. So let's crack on with pelvic floor straight away. What is it and why is it important? Okay, well, I've brought my, I like bringing a model. So um, let me know if you can all see it well. But I think the pelvic floor is a mystery to so many women because you can't always feel it. Studies over and over show if women are told how to do a pelvic floor, most of them may not do a correct contraction. So I'll do my absolute best today to make it as clear as possible. So looking in from the top, this is your rectum, uterus on top, pubic bone is there, the ovaries are there. And um, although this is a very basic, <laughs> very basic vulva <laughs> and, and back, back passage, what's really helpful to know if you would look through the midline, this is what you would see. And this is our super clever mechanism. The pelvic floor is like a ball, very robust. 
And it's a bit like a circus tent. It doesn't just hang there, it's hung and slung. And that's what makes it so, so clever, really. And I think Ruth just explained that beautifully. Um, so at, we can see the pubic bone there. Here's the bladder and the urethra, the pipe you weed through. The yellow bit is the front wall of the vagina, the vagina and the back wall. And that beautiful kinked water slide, which is our rectum. And the kink is caused by the pelvic floor. So it helps to maintain continence. That's why it's so important to unkink it when you empty your bowels. That's why we, you know, we're designed to squat behind a tree. <laughs> and that's why you put your feet on top of a stool to unkink it. So effectively you don't have to poo, poo around the corner, <laughs> basically. So they are really all important muscles. Considering they control your bladder, they stop a leak. They also coordinate with your bladder so you can empty your bladder. They also support bowel uh, continence, also control wind. So you can step into a quiet yoga class and get yourself in all sorts of positions without embarrassing, embarrassing parts or sounds. On top of that, they also support those pelvic organs like the rectum, the the uterus sits on top, the cervix sits there, and make sure that your bladder, your uterus, and your rectum stay in the optimal position because they can slip down to the middle and down a little bit. Yes. That's keeping um, all our bits in. Keep it all, keep it all in there. It's, so it can help, even if there is a small prolapse, it can help to prevent and manage prolapse as well. What is a prolapse? So a prolapse is when any of the either the rectum, the bladder, or the cervix slips downwards and towards the middle. But I'll probably come back to that later, but the key is even if that happens, and it's very, very common, it may not cause symptoms, and it often can be managed with pelvic floor muscle training and other things, so you're not broken. And the one thing, the first rule of prolapse we always say now is don't Google prolapse. <laughs> Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> because there's so anything, much really anything medical, God. But yeah, no, probably. I'm... Yeah, but yeah. See, it generates that fear, doesn't it? And women do feel very. They often feel sort of really distressed and that sense of being broken, as you said, which is is dreadful. Absolutely. And the truth is, with with a prolapse, if it's well managed, you know, women go back to running, go back to the weight training. Um, as long, you know, as as long as they seek help from a healthcare professional, they know exactly what to do. So please tell your friends as well, you're not broken and lots of things can be done. So those pelvic floor muscles are really all singing or dancing muscles. So they need a fabulous endurance capacity because you want to be continent 24 hours a day. So they've got those marathon style muscles, which is, if you sort of think about it in, in muscle terms, it's like your beefsteak, but they also need speed. So when you suddenly cut in strength, when you suddenly cough a sneeze, trip over the dog or lift something, you, you need a very strong, fast contraction, like your 100 meter split muscles, more like your chicken breast sort of muscles. So they need those as well. And on top of that, it needs quite a lot of muscle bulk and strength to prevent prolapse and be strong enough when you lift heavier weights. So, so you know, why does the pelvic floor become weaker during menopause? Um, <laughs> good question. Some of it are early risk factors. So it becomes apparent into the menopause. And sometimes it's hard to know what's aging and what's hormonal changes. So early risk factors, one of the big ones, there is no doubt is vaginal delivery. That's why it's so important women have a pelvic health assessment after vaginal delivery. Um, but often those symptoms don't become apparent two or three decades after childbirth, which often goes inside with the menopause. <laughs> so sometimes those two things are correlated, but doesn't necessarily mean they're related to the menopause because there, there's childbirth, there's constipation, there are genetic factors, there's weight, there's other factors that play a role as well. Of course, like Ruth explained very well earlier, there are also urogenital symptoms of the menopause, urogenital atrophy of the vulva, the bladder and uh, the vagina. Just and when these tissues be... start to shrink. That's right, and, and that can be so miserable. You know, you might not be able to wear your favorite pair of jeans anymore. Uh, people always think about dryness, but it can also be watery uh, discharge. Uh, like Ruth said, there can be an increased risk of infection. Um, so the, the vaginal tissue changes. I, I really like the analogy of estrogen as water to the garden. Um, and your vagina, I always think of your vaginal tissue and your vulva and your bladder tissue as the one plant in your garden that needs constant watering, really. And that's where the so, top of the vaginal estrogen comes in as well. 
So with the drop in estrogen comes a weaker pelvic floor. So the vaginal estrogen that Ruth was talking about can also help with our pelvic floor? It's not always so much weaker because that can be trained. Um, although there is some evidence that estrogen does support muscle strength, but the jury is still out. <laughs> the jury is still out there. Like most things in women's health, just often not enough research. Um, but we do lose, lose mean lean muscle mass into the menop into the yes. menopause, and of course that will impact your pelvic floor muscles as well. Yeah, it's, inevitable, it's not really, just the decline in estrogen; it often also is changes in lifestyle. Women may have less sex, and I know we're going to talk about that more. And obviously, sex really benefits the pelvic floor as long as it's why it is. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> Um, when there is arousal, you get congestion of the tissue. We have erectile tissue like men have. Then when there's an orgasm, you get the decongestion. So you get a lovely influx, of all the healthy hormones, circulation, etc. And with losing some elasticity into the menopause, because your collagen isn't as springy as it was before, we really want to keep that. An orgasm is a pelvic floor muscle contraction. So on top of that, you're also doing your exercises. Although we do like you to Yay. do more of them because we like, if you're in a progressive strengthening routine for your pelvic floor muscles, we like you to do them three times a day. And especially into menopause, sex three times a day might just be a bit of a big, <laughs> a bit of a big ask, I would say. Ask. But it's, yeah. it's an We're busy you women. Really don't to do We're busy women. <laughs> you really don't want to do your exercise it's an option that's available as long as it's comfortable <laughs> enjoyable <laughs> and it works so and let's talk works. about the exercises because I think what several yeah. of the questions that were coming up there were saying you know why am I experiencing urgency well why do I leak when I'm, I'm coughing or sneezing and yeah. it's all around the weak pelvic floor so yeah. can the exercises really make a difference yes they, I know some pelvic, once you know how to do them, they're simple, they're boring and notoriously hard to comply with, <laughs> but they really work. They've got, a, if you look at the medical evidence, that 1A evidence, which is the strongest evidence you can get medically, most surgery and medication doesn't quite, <laughs> quite get there. So let that be the motivation to do it and considering what it does for you. So then, you, yes, indeed, you've got stress urinary incontinence, like when you have lots of intra-abdominal pressure, your bladder neck can't quite, and your pelvic floor muscles can't, can't quite take the load. So you get some leakage of urine. That key in the door moment is more of an unstable bladder, which like your bladder contracting and you might not have time to get your genes down. And a lot of women have a combination of those, of those two. And of course, into the menopause, two or three decades after vaginal livery or a lifelong of constipation, Prolapse symptoms can become apparent as well. And that's things like vaginal heaviness, vaginal bulging, and maybe difficulty emptying your bowels, difficulty emptying your bladder. And again, that can also lead to urinary tract infection, but also the declining estrogen and the filth and vaginal atrophy that Rhys just talked about. So all these things come together in those decades. Okay. So I'm going to, when we get to the panel section, ask you to actually take us through a pelvic floor exercise. So yeah, I'd love to do that. Walking. Yeah, But um, conscious of time, what I'd just like you to cover now is if you think you're not doing your pelvic floor exercises right, um, yeah. what can you do? Where do you go? Well, I think, first of all, download the Squeezy app. And Emily has offered to put it in the chat. I don't know if it's already there. It's, it's got really good information on it. It tells you exactly what to do. If you've done it for six weeks and your symptoms are not improving, it doesn't mean they don't work and it's an assessment. Go and see your GP, go and see a specialist healthcare um, professional, which can be a physio, can be a continence nurse. Keep knocking on the door until you see someone. Because one thing about that, that nice guidelines that level 1A of evidence does mean, unless a very compelling reason not to refer, you've got to be referred. And I think we all need to get a lot more angry and keep knocking on doors Absolutely. to make sure 
absolutely the surface because is in place it's it's what you don't want to be padding up unless you absolutely have to and for most yeah. women dealing with the pelvic floor exercises regularly getting advice from a women's health physiotherapist which is not the same as a physio that's a woman by the way which is what i, I didn't realize until i met christine it's a whole specialist area and they can make an enormous difference to you whether you've got issues around uh, leaking and incontinence whether you're struggling with issues around pelvic pain, um, all of these things they can really help with. So on the Squeezy app, there is uh, a directory of women's health physiotherapists, so you could pop your postcode in. And you can also, of course, get referred via your GP. So I'd urge you to do that. Can I just, right. like one Last second, thing. to squeeze something in there? Because I think that's so important that we want strength, we want endurance. We also need a responsive bouncy pelvic floor. So if you have an assessment and you've got an increased muscle tone, so the muscles grip a little bit too much, that's something we can teach and change as well. So it really is all about a bouncy responsive pelvic floor, not a rigid type one. Yeah. So we want a nice long and strong one and it can be done for everyone, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, and I could just see someone talking about the too tight pelvic floor. Yes, that's absolutely right. I think that's one of the reasons why it's worth seeing a specialist. If the pelvic floor exercises aren't working, it might be that you're doing them too much or too hard, yeah. as yeah. opposed to not doing them strongly enough. And that's where the specialist physio can really help. Now we're going to stop with you, Christine, because we're running out. We have run out of time. Thank you. So, um, see you soon again. Yep, see you in a minute. And let's bring up uh, Claire's slide because I want to just introduce you to the fabulous Dr. Claire McCauley, um, whose day job is a, an oncologist treating people with breast cancer. But she's joined us today in her other role, which is a self-confessed sex science geek and founder of the rather brilliant Pleasure Possibility, which is a coaching programme um, that helps people create the kind of sex life that's right for them. Um, she's just got a wealth of knowledge. She's incredibly kind, pragmatic, and unbelievably unshockable. So um, can't wait to hear what she's got to say. Claire, join us. Hello, Jackie. I'm delighted Hi. to be here. What a marvellous introduction. <laughs> well, I'm excited to, to chat to you again. And we've got so much to talk about. I know this so is much. a big and popular topic. So let's crack straight on. Um, we hear a lot about lack of libido and issues around desire um, during midlife and the menopause. So what's going on? Well, I think there's various different things going on. And, and the truth of it is a lot of what you will hear is it's to do with our hormones and we just don't have enough estrogen and maybe there's a, questions about testosterone. But in my experience, it's not just about that. It's not just about hormones. What I see is that a lot of things that we've carried throughout our lives in terms of our sexuality and our sexual expression just all come together at the menopause. And the menopause sometimes gets the blame when in fact, there's a whole lot of other things going on. And, and one of the most important things I find around the concept of libido and desire is that what we think it is, isn't actually what it is at all. So we talk about a sex drive. Now, it's not actually a drive. So a drive is something within our body that's there to keep us alive. So that's like hunger, thirst, those kind of things. It's not a drive. It's, it's a motivational reward system. And the, the, clue, the clue is kind of in the name. We need to be motivated to do it. And there needs to be some reward for us to continue to want to do it. And if we get to this point in our lives, we've already heard about vaginal pain, we, there might be tiredness, brain fog, all those kind of things that are going on. If there is not a reward for doing it, if it's painful, for example, you're not going to be inclined to want to do it again. So there's all sorts of aspects around libido and desire that get pinned on hormones that are quite often not really anything to do with hormones, although that is important as well. We've already heard about the big issue of vaginal dryness. We know that around 70% of people experiencing the menopause are going to have some impact on their sex life and a lot of that might be to do with dryness and pain because mm. inevitably side, that's going to play with your mind you're going to think well if it absolutely hurts, why absolutely. would i do it because our mind is what is is the most important sex organ that we have what's going on in our pants is absolutely real we might be dry we might be losing sensation which is real people come to me and say my clitoris is shrinking but that can't possibly be happening and i say no it is happening it's absolutely happening the process of atrophy that ruth described where we're losing tissue because they're sensitive to estrogen is actually happening. And as we're losing that tissue, we're also losing the sensitivity of that tissue. So there are physical things that are happening. 
but there are also messages that we are carrying and have been carrying from childhood and puberty and our early sexual experience that we're carrying forward into our lives now and one of the big um, myths really is about desire itself this idea that we have this concept of spontaneous desire so that we should be feeling horny out of the blue while standing with manigolds on it doing the washing up we should be hit by as I call it a bolt of desire to the fanny now actually that's not true we know from we know from research that the vast majority of people in female bodies do not experience spontaneous desire so desire that comes out of the blue yet if you look at the things that we're taught, how sex is portrayed to us societally, all of the kind of things that we think we should be spontaneously out of the blue want to be horny. What the vast majority of people in female bodies experience is called responsive desire, which is the opposite to spontaneous desire. It means that when sexy things are happening and we get going, then we go, oh, actually, I'm quite enjoying this. If I had a pound for everybody that came to me and said, oh, I really couldn't be bothered, but when I got going, I really enjoyed it. And then I go, why don't I do this more often? That's because of responsive desire. Mm. If you are standing waiting for a bolt of desire to the fanny, it isn't coming. It wasn't coming when you were 25, and it's certainly not coming now that you're 55. <laughs> However, if you understand that you have responsive desire, that means that you can start to make some choices around that. Responsive desire comes when we put ourselves in a context that feels sexy to us. So context is also important. And we need to understand that stress plays a big part in this. Yeah. A very big part in our ability to be able to experience desire. And of course, this might, for some of us, be the most stressful times in our lives. We might have, we may have kids, teenagers, aging parents, stressful jobs. So stress also gets in the way of our ability to be able to experience desire. Yeah. And I mean, that's a big deal, isn't it? Because I think uh, certainly in my in my clinic, a lot of women talk to me about the fact that they you know, they just don't feel sexy anymore. They're, it's not just that they're, they're tired and they haven't got the bolt of, of desire that you, you talked about so well there, but also, you know, they're feeling really stressed. And often, you know, there's, there's quite a lot of weight gain that can come during the yeah. menopause. It's that time when women aren't exercising as much because they've lost confidence or they're struggling with pelvic floor. And so they're not feeling sexy. So What's your advice to, to, to even get in that point where you'd put yourself in the context where you could suddenly start to feel the desire? Because if you don't put yourself in that context because you're not confident enough, then it's not going to happen, is it? Absolutely. And I think there's a really important part around some of that, which is there are so many shoots about what our sex life should look like. And we're carrying so many messages about what sexy should look like, should feel like. And of course, most of that is geared around young people for it for example you know so we, are we to look a certain way our sexuality should look like it's expressed in a particular kind of way and a lot of what I do when women come to see me is to kind of rewind that all a little bit and say okay well let's understand the messages that you're carrying because the things that you learned when you were 14 and 15 are still running the show now whether you know it or not so we need to unpick sometimes what messages what beliefs are we holding about what sex should look like and actually do they still serve us at this age is that do we still actually believe a lot of that stuff or do we need to throw some of them out, take some of that old stuff to the charity shop to make space for a new experience of our life as a sexual being? And actually, sex can be the best it's ever been at this point in our lives for all sorts of reasons. But we need to deal with issues like body confidence. How do I feel in this body now? What is it that I'm experiencing in this body now? What do I want it to be able to do for me? And the, the single most important thing, I think, is that we get away from this idea that sex is a penis in a vagina. So that's what we think sex is. It's not real sex unless a penis is in a vagina. And I often say, mm, go and ask the lesbians because they're probably having much better sex than you, for example. But start to think about what is it that actually feels good to me? And I tell people to throw away a notion of sex and intercourse altogether and focus on pleasure. What feels pleasurable in my body? What feels good to me? And actually, very often I say that to women and they don't know because it's never occurred to them to be their own pleasure explorer. What feels good in this body? What do I like? What would I want to ask someone else to do to me? What do I want to do to someone else? Because if we want to have a meaningful sex life, we need to know what we want. We're very often left with the idea that pleasure is something that someone else gives to us. And in fact, that's not the case at all. And if you don't know what it is that you enjoy and what you want to have and what you want to explore, how can you possibly expect a partner to know? So yeah. there's something here about thinking about 
the context and, and, and who you want to be as a sexual being now. And it's not about a penis and a vagina, because actually some of our partners, if we're in heterosexual relationships, may be having their own issues with, the, with regards to erectile dysfunction and all of those kind of things. But that doesn't mean you can't have a meaningful sex life that is focused on pleasure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think another concern that tends to come up is this sense of if you if you don't feel ready for intimacy, you're not, you know, that's just not happening right now. How do you handle it if you think the relationship's being affected by that? Yeah. and again intimacy means intercourse that's what we mean if we can't have intercourse we can't have intimacy and of course you can be intimate with somebody I mean spending five minutes gazing into your partner's eyes for example can be a far more intimate experience than sticking body parts in you so it's again it's about thinking <laughs> around what it is that we want to experience in terms of intimacy because often people will come to me and they'll say they want to have an intimate life but what they really mean is I can't put this penis in this vagina but there's many other ways to be intimate with people and the and the key point of any of that is about communication with your partner so I many people come to me and they say I need to make this work because I have to have sex with him otherwise x y and z so they're having duty sex which for example sounds like the absolute worst kind of sex you could possibly want to have but that's what people come with and I say to people you do you think your partner wants to be having intercourse with you that's painful if they knew and of course the vast majority of partners do not want to be having and for you to be having a painful experience so that they can have a particular experience. But if we don't tell, if we don't talk, if we don't communicate, it's really very difficult for our partners to know. So communication is absolutely the key. Yeah. Because if you want to have something different in your sex life, and many of the people that I see at midlife are starting to understand that their sex life can be way, way more expansive than the sex that they have been having up to now. Communication is a key part of that. So we need to really think carefully about our communication styles. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think you had a prop there that you brought. Is there oh, like well, just know? because I don't go anywhere without my vulva. This is Verity, the velvet vulva, but we'll use her in the panel session. But actually just to help illustrate the things that, that Ruth was talking about earlier in terms of, of what's the vulva and what's in our pants. So the, this is the outer labia that's covered with hair, our inner labia here, which, look, it's a puppet. It's just the best thing ever. It's a puppet. And then we have the <laughs> vaginal canal itself and, and this rough part, which some people call the G-spot, then the clitoral hood at the top here with the clitoris underneath. And then you, the urethra that um, Kirsten was talking about in terms of peeing is between usually the clitoris and the vagina in the middle here. We don't pee out of our vagina, people. It is a separate hole. So we'll look at her a little bit later on if we need to. Oh, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah, getting acquainted with what's in your pants. What do you like? How do you like to be touched? Yeah. What kind of uh, lubrication is helpful for you? All sorts of things. But we need to be starting to get up close and personal with our own verities. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Claire, thank you so much. That was great. What a whistle-stop tour. Okay, um, let's move on to the panel session um, and let's bring everybody up and let's get talking with some of the questions there and some of the questions that have been sent to me privately as well um, because you've all got a load of questions. So um, brilliant stuff. Where's Ruth? Ruth, have you gone? I'm coming, I'm coming. Here I am. There we are. <laughs> <laughs> Um, great. Okay. Um, first question. This one's for you, uh, Christine. Um, challenges and issues around urgency, urinary urgency. Uh, this is someone who has done pelvic floor exercises after having three children and all going great, but all of a sudden finding a you know, real level of urgency. Um, is it about uh, are the exercises not working anymore? Should they be seeking broader advice? What do you think? Yeah, there can be different reasons for urgency and obviously urogenital atrophy can be part of it. But the most important thing is really to start looking at the bladder as well. The pelvic floor will help to control the bladder. The bladder is like a bag with a muscle around as well. It's involuntary. So the first thing we always do when people have urgency is do a bladder chart. Because without a chart, we don't know. See... What the urgency is, how much you're actually being out, with what urgency, when leaks happen. And until we've actually got a journal and we've got a chart of what's happening, we can't advise what to do. And pelvic floor muscle retraining will be part of that. Really important part of that, but bladder retraining as well. It's quite simple. In a way, I always love treating people with urgency and stable bladders because I know it really works. So I'd always think, oh yeah, this, this, this will work. We can be very effective here. So if you can't work it out yourself, go and see a pelvic health physio or talk to your GP. 
Um, but one little tip with urgency, mental math really works. So start controlling it. So what we always say to is just a simple tool in the box, start counting down from 100s and sevens. For most of us, that's hard enough to, it's a bit like you might feel really urgent, you put the key in the door and suddenly you see your friend coming past and you forget all about it. Okay, it's that total distraction to stop that reflex bladder. And then you don't always have a, a surprise friend at the hand. So mental math can work, but really if the urgency is impacting your life and you become like a confirmed toilet hopper, please go and see someone. Don't put up with it because it's very treatable or it can be. Yeah, you mentioned the key in the door urgency and that's actually a recognized phenomenon, isn't it? Can you just explain it? Well, basically it is your, basically your bladder is, is in charge instead of you in charge. Rather than the neural pathways go, as soon as you put the key in the door, the neural pathway go contract bladder. And really ideally that will go via a higher brain. <laughs> so you've got control over stopping that until you're on the loo and you've got your genes open and down and then the bladder can contract. So it's, it's almost all like a sort of Pavlov's dog thing, isn't it? Yeah. You know that the minute you get home, you'll go to the loo. So the door key goes in the door and your bladder thinks, oh, here we go. Yeah. And, and or, it's about being able to control that. Yeah, or running water. That's why if once you've got an unstable bladder, maybe don't wee in the shower because before you know it, you're training your bladder. Water, wee. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's all those things that, um, and the other thing is get into the habit of never running to the loo. Walk slowly, take your time, so train your bladder, stay in charge of your bladder. There are lots of different things you can do depending on what's really are the underlying causes. So if you're not sure and the simple tools don't work, please go and see. Seek help. No right. medals to be won by putting up with it, really. No, absolutely. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, something else that's come in um, to me, and we've talked a lot about vaginal estrogen and all the wonderful benefits it can have and how it should be on prescription for everybody and the marvellous, but what about the women who can't have it, who've been advised not to have it, um, perhaps because they, they um, have a history of breast cancer? What can they do about the issues which are still very real, but potentially something that they can't treat in the way that we've been discussing? I wonder, given um, your position, Claire, are you able to give us some advice on that first? There are very, very, very few people, in fact, probably no people, other than people who don't have a vagina, that can't have vaginal estrogen. So even people who have had breast cancer, for example, I'm a breast cancer oncologist and I prescribe vaginal estrogens. So there's quite a lot of misunderstanding and misinformation, maybe old information, for example. There are very few people who cannot have vaginal estrogens. Now, some people may choose not to. So there may be some people, for example, who've had hormone sensitive breast cancer, who may choose not to run any kind of risk in terms of estrogen. I think a way of trying to understand it is one, using vaginal estrogen, for a full year results in the same amount of estrogen in our bodies over that time as one oral estrogen HRT tablet. So the amount that's absorbed within us to the rest of our body through the vagina is very, very small. So that means that there's very few people can't have it. Now, those who might choose not to have it, then we have the options of long acting moisturizers that Ruth's already mentioned. So you might use them. You could use them every day if you wish. Most people will usually use them somewhere between two to three times a week. Um, but certainly if, if someone wants to try vaginal estrogen, then certainly there is no particular reason why anyone with a vagina shouldn't have it. So I think it's there's a lot of that is old old information and I think it's probably starting to filter through now and if you know someone in that situation there's lots of information available online that they can take to the healthcare provider to perhaps update them a little um, many GPs rightly will sometimes want some information from an oncologist if it is someone with a breast cancer for example but otherwise most people can have vaginal estrogen. Great advice. Um, something else I'd sort of throw into the mix there from a nutrition angle is just to think about if you are being prone um, to issues around either urinary tract infections or the thrush is to think about what's going on with the bacteria, because in the same way as we've got beneficial bacteria in our gut. Um, we have it in our vagina, it's specifically the strain lactobacillus, um, the one you find in yogurt, for example, and that those levels can also be affected by the drop in estrogen. So you can get specialist probiotics 
that are specifically targeted uh, either towards urinary tract infections or towards thrush, um, which will have the right types of bacteria in, plus sometimes either a bit of garlic or cranberry or um, grapeseed, things that can be either antifungal or, or antibacterial. So that can be something that could help as well if you're struggling with those areas and you're looking at, to address it in other ways as well as, or perhaps instead of the vaginal estrogen if it's something you're not confident with. Um, okay, I've seen something else that's just popped up a couple of times, uh, and I don't know if it's the same person asking the question, but um, there's some interesting comments around inability to empty the bladder um, completely. Who'd like to take that? I can see both uh, Christine and Ruth nodding. Um, do you want to say, start, Ruth, and then we'll pick up with Christine? Yeah, I mean, Christine will be a lot more just specialised in this area, but but one way, Christine, I think you know, um, is is popping your feet on a stool in front of, in front of the blue, just so you're tilting that bladder to help empty, and just having patience to empty your bladder fully, not rushing going to the loo. That's interesting because I know that you, Christine, you often recommend putting your feet on a stool when it comes to having a poo, but I didn't realise mm. that could help with emptying your bladder as well. Absolutely right, Ruth, because okay. pelvic floor muscles wrap around and are tighter when you, and you actually want to loosen your pelvic floor muscles when you empty your bladder. If there's a level of prolapse, it can also be that the urethra is in a slightly different position. Um, that's why you also get this thing, what we call post-micturition dribble, that you think you're done and you stand up and it's a little dribble. And what works really well for a lot of women that they just wiggle around and you have to find out a little bit what your wiggle is <laughs> to fully empty your bladder. We tend to stand up, sit down again, so you fully, fully empty it and strengthen your pelvic floor muscles. Because if there's more muscle bulk and more support, there will be more effective emptying and good bladder habits. Mm. Yeah. Stay yeah. well hydrated throughout the day. Yeah. So you've, you know, yeah. Yeah. Something else that's come up actually, um, I can't quite see it, but I know I saw it earlier when I was scrolling through, is getting up to pee in the night. Um, mm. Comments? Yeah. I mean, I would say go to you first, Jackie. Think about what you're eating and drinking throughout the day. Think about your stimulants. Think about when you're having a last cup of coffee. Um, realizing how long it takes your body to process those things you know it takes several hours to, to process just one cup of coffee and that you know it can have a cumulative effect if you take if you have multiple cups of coffee throughout the day and I think people forget that they think oh well I had my last cup of coffee about two or three o'clock so that's fine but that might be their fourth or fifth cup that day so that has a, a knock-on effect doesn't it yeah I think it's worth understanding there's something called antidiuretic hormone um, mm -hmm. that rises as we go to sleep so it's designed essentially to let us sleep right through the night so once we you know become potty trained and stop wetting the bed um antidiuretic hormone is something that develops now as we age antidiuretic hormone can start to decline but more specifically it's, it's directly affected by alcohol and also by stress so if either of those are key factors in your life and you're constantly getting up to pee you know my view is you're all far too young to be getting up to pee every night and we and, and let's face it sleep is at a premium when we're going to the menopause you've already got the hormonal surges and everything else making life difficult so the last thing you need is your bladder telling you to get up as well so really start to think about that and ease back on on the booze particularly because that can be a game changer when it comes to just making sure your body can actually support you to get through the night and you, just you to add to that as well, just to add to that as well, Jackie, one of the other things is, of course, people might be waking up because our sleep changes as we get to the menopause and the change mm. in the hormones. And actually, we might wake in the night. When we wake in the night, it's the same as we wake in the morning, the, that antidiuretic hormone falls and actually you might need a pee. And often what I find is that people can't, you know, they, they're awake, they can't get back to sleep, but they actually need to get up and have a pee, but their body's just not all quite there. So for a lot of people, I say if they're waking at night is get up and go for a pee, not because you want to train it, but actually see if that helps you get back to sleep, because actually often it can be that people need a pee and they're not quite aware of it yeah yeah good point mm -hmm. now something that's come up here which is very much for you here claire um that um the issues around um libido so um this is this is a lady who's been on testosterone for about six months libido has definitely returned but really it's either struggling to achieve orgasm or it's taking a really long time yeah. so what what are your thoughts on that so that's really, really common. And again, for all of the reasons that we've described is that, that everything down there isn't working the way it worked before because of the lack of estrogen. So there's a number of different things. One, 
take there's well there's a, dip, a number of different approaches one take the focus off orgasm altogether because actually no orgasm ever appeared when it was forced so there's something about we then start to get into this cycle of oh i really want i'm never going to have an orgasm it's going to take forever and guess what it then takes forever so there's something about maybe taking the pressure off in terms of trying to achieve orgasm and again orgasm is one of these things that that's the only goal of having intimate partner connection or indeed intimate touch with yourself is if we can take the pressure off in terms of orgasm that's the first thing testosterone i'm very glad it's worked for this person in particular it doesn't in my experience it really doesn't necessarily it's not a magic bullet if it, if this was all just to do with hormones that would be easy but uh, frankly it isn't so i'm glad that it's helped you can sometimes use a little bit of the testosterone gel on the clitoris that can actually help as well bring back some sensitivity um, and keep using it so it is a use it or lose it system and again take the focus off orgasm the more we become sexually aroused and we bring blood flow to the vaginal wall and the pelvic floor that's a useful it's like exercising any muscle um, and again think about pelvic floor exercises because pelvic floor exercises give you an enhanced experience of orgasm because it's pelvic floor muscle contraction basically the other thing to think about is if you're using testosterone and you're not using vaginal estrogen it might be worth trying some vaginal estrogen if you're not already doing that because that helps these tissues to regenerate to a certain degree but it's absolutely real i think it's a really um it's a really common experience to either not be able to orgasm or it takes a lot longer also think about investing in some fabulous sex toys they're bound to help clitoral suction devices in particular are fabulous and were definitely designed with middle-aged women in mind i think where do you go if, if someone suddenly thought oh never thought about sex toys i mean you know google can be dangerous you don't want to sort of end up in, in entirely the wrong place by googling the wrong thing um where where would you go where do people there's go there's loads and loads of different online providers of sex toys you know love honey bondara uh, joe divine there's all sorts of different you know you'll not go wrong and again so for example this is a widely discussed topic in my facebook group around who's tried what sex toy and what happened and all those kind of things so you know there are places to have those discussions if that's something that's never even occurred to you before um, and it can be fun you know just take a little bit of glee and a little bit of curiosity and see what happens and become your own pleasure adventurer see what works see what you like see what you what you would like to try you might be surprised Brilliant. I have Brilliant. to put those names down in the chat box. People will be feverishly just rewinding <laughs> the recording back just, now. Just put links to sex toys in the sex chat. <laughs> well, my work here is done. <laughs> if, if you scroll back, you can see a link to Claire's um, Facebook group. Um, so you can oh, join yeah. the chat on the sex toys if this is something that's getting you going. <laughs> but it but it's paused over that bit on the recording the most, Claire. <laughs> Shall I send the time code out to everyone so they know exactly where to find it? Um, Christine, I think it brings us very neatly to pelvic floor exercises. So can you take us through how to do them properly? Absolutely. And let's all sit here and yeah. have a go. And also in terms of sex toys, I couldn't support that more because often women come and see us and they've been uh, prescribed dilators if there's vaginal pain or pelvic pain. And I always so promote... Um, a, a good sex toy, a good vibrator, especially the long, thin ones. You know, they don't have to be big phallic penises. <laughs> there are some really nice, lovely designed <laughs> ones now. And often it's such a better way of bridging the gap from a medical device to actually an enjoyable sexual experience again. Okay, the pelvic floor. Yeah, if you all uncross your legs for a moment. And that's... Uh, so thinking anatomically that two thirds of your pelvic floor muscles sit behind the back passage. So now we can put women in big MRIs and ask them to cue things and things about different things. We know what works best, not for all, but for most women and back passage cue works best. So imagine being in a really quiet library and you need to pass wind. So what you want to do is stop that fart. Okay, and like somebody very wisely said in the chat, at one point you have to let it go as well. So then imagine going outside in a really busy high street and finally you can let go <laughs> because it's noisy. Okay, so that's the letting go bit. Then you need to do three different things. You need strength. So it doesn't need to be super strong. It's like, you know, just closing the bladder neck but about 80% of the strongest contraction you can do. Hold it for 10 seconds. The cold standard is 10 times 10 seconds. So you've got the endurance. But then you also need that speed. 
So those are those quick flicks, those quick contractions. Do check if you get it right. You can feel with one finger if you can feel a closure, or maybe at home you've got a willing volunteer. See if you can who you can find. Um, also, you can have a look with a mirror, which, if you're brave enough, is a really helpful thing to do. And kind of your pelvic winks at you if you do a good pelvic floor muscle con contraction. But the, the really simple one, and you can read so many very complex things. It doesn't need to be so complex. Just imagine passing me. You don't need to do the front, the back, and all the different things. Stop a fart, and there's a really good chance that you're doing a good pelvic floor muscle. And how long do you hold it for? That's a good question. It's a bit how heavy should the weight be a lift? If you can only do two seconds, start with two seconds. If you can do 10 seconds, hold it for 10 seconds. So when you're in your progressive strengthening, often we start with one second and then we can see the pelvic floor go. <laughs> so that's what we, and every week we add a second, up to 10, or up six to 10. And then after three or four months of repeating that three times a day, study shows that you've done enough progressive strengthening that your pelvic floor strength is optimal if you're doing the right thing, which you may need to seek some help for. And then you can go down to once a day for the rest of your life. Yeah, it will be done. So as you said earlier, it's boring, but it's absolutely worth it. And I would urge anyone here who is struggling either with their pelvic floor exercises or generally with any kind of pelvic pain or discomfort, do seek advice from a women's health physiotherapist because it can make all the difference. Okay, my goodness, time is ticking on. So um, I'm just gonna check, take one last question and then we're going to do top tips. Um, I did notice that somebody mentioned in the, in the chat that they were feeling, uh, they had been feeling a bit broken and they hadn't realized it till it was mentioned and now they don't feel so bad. And I think that's, that's great. One of the things I interviewed Myra Robson um, back in season one, actually, of the Happy Menopause. She's the founder of the Squeezy app, that wonderful app that helps you with your pelvic floor exercises. And the phrase she used was common, but not normal. And I think it's really important to understand that, you know, you're really not alone. We're all very comfortable talking about hot flushes now and, and even mental health, a lot more common to admit to menopausal anxiety, but we're not talking about all the intimate stuff. And, and that's a real problem because it means you don't know that most people are suffering too and they really are and there are solutions and what's great to know is that while it might be one in three women struggling with these things that can be resolved very very easily if you get the right expert help so i really would urge you to um to reach out okay i'm just scrolling through to see if there's a, a, a mess any other actually that most of them have been pretty well answered by the panel busily beavering away well done in between sessions so in that case i am going to ask each panel member to give me their one sort of top tip uh, relating to the theme they've been here to talk about today so you know libido vaginal health and pelvic floor so i'm going to start with you ruth because you went first so what's your one top tip I would say my one top tip is, is have a peek. Know your own body, definitely. Um, you know, pay as much attention to this area as you do to other areas of your body. You know, how much attention do we pay sort of from neck upwards? You know, we all spend vast amounts of money on exfoliators and moisturizers and things. And this area of your body needs a lot of attention too. So I would say, yeah, have a peek, know what it looks like. Look out for lumps and bumps, look out for any changes. And um, and do something about it if you notice anything. Yeah, get the help. Brilliant. Thank you. Christine, what's your top tip? Well, it's particularly to the menopause, physical activity and exercise helps your sexual experience as well. Don't get comfortable on the sofa, even if you lose your confidence. Your pelvis is robust. You can train, especially strength training and high intensity training. You might, it might be baby step, big leaps. Please don't get comfortable on the sofa and keep moving. Yeah, I think that's good advice, you know, because it's something I observe in my clinic is that we do tend to move to the mat when it mm. comes to um, <laughs> uh, midlife, you know, nothing wrong with yoga and Pilates. I think they're both great things, but we need that variety, don't we, Christine? Mm. Yeah. So make sure you're getting the weight, um, uh, the resistance work, the cardiovascular work, really important. Okay, and um, Claire, what's your tip? Put your body in the bed. And by that, what I mean is that it's not going to happen unless you choose. 
you know, we hear, I hear a lot about, oh, they have no desire on the beat and all that, but it's not going to happen if you don't prioritize your pleasure. And so you have to show up for it. It's not happening. It's not going to happen from out there. Put your body in the bed, see what happens. Amazing. Yeah. Great. Well, I'm going to give you some advice and uh, it's going to be general because I could be here all night and it's nearly time to go and I don't want to overrun because I promise that we'll finish bang on time. My advice is this uh, when it comes to the, the menopause generally, but also these areas specifically. I really hope that what we've talked about tonight has just made you realise quite how much um, help there really is out there. Um, and it's really important, I think, that you take a little bit of control yourself um, because the stuff you can do uh, beyond what the GP can offer, um, GPs are brilliant. They're also overworked. They have 10 minutes with you. Um, and depending on the GP, they may be more or less informed about the various other options that, that are there for you. So I think it's really important to understand that you've got lots of specialist areas that can help. You've got women's health physiotherapists who can make a huge difference to what's going on with your pelvic floor and all the associated issues that that can bring with the potential urinary stress incontinence, the, the prolapse, the issues around um, even sort of rectal issues and rectal incontinence and pelvic pain, they can really help with that. I think look to work with um, clinical educators and, and nurses like Ruth, because you've got these specialists, you've got these menopause specialists who are um, you know, recognised by the British Menopause Society. And, and these people really can help you. So you know, reach out to them. And then you know, from the intimate place, you've got the wonderful sex coaches like Claire. I saw one of the questions actually that popped in the chat as to whether or not you work with couples. Yes. Uh, Yes, so, work with all people of all sizes, shapes, genders, orientation, yeah, absolutely. Yep, yeah, yeah. so she'll work with anybody, basically, is what we're hearing. <laughs> Yay! Um, because, you know, everybody deserves to have a happy menopause. That's really something I feel incredibly strongly about. So my advice to you is don't put up with it. Um, find the information out there. We've given you lots of links to our websites, to other websites, to sex toys. You know, the, there's lots of solutions out there. Grasp them with both hands and, and dare to ask the question because there, there really are answers out there. And I think that's in, incredibly um, important. So before we wrap up, um, let's just bring up the... Um, Prize draw slide, all well done, Emily, you're, you're there. Oh, I've just lost the chat, so hang on a second. because I'm about to announce it and I've just lost my message. One second, just about to announce the winners, so don't go away. Um, here we go, right, prize draw. Congratulations. Um, the, the winner of the fabulous Better You, my absolute favourite supplement company, and all their fabulous magnesium and goodies, is Zoe Barrett. Um, Zoe, congratulations. If you can, um, uh, I think we will have your email address actually, won't we, with, with the sign up. So we'll be in touch to get your um, home address to send that off to you. So congratulations, Zoe. Um, the second winner of the fabulous um, Silk Intimacy Hamper, and that's got that wonderful water-based uh, parabens-free um, moisturizer that Ruth was talking about earlier. That's Janet Connolly of... Um, uh, uh, so congratulations, Janet. Again, we'll be in touch. And then the lucky winner of my two books, which is obviously the best prize, um, is uh, Nicola Shaw. So again, Nicola, congratulations. And we will absolutely be in touch. Um, so uh, last slide, please, um, because I've got some thank yous now. Huge thank yous to the sponsors, obviously, um, Better You and Silk for uh, sharing um, those wonderful prizes. Congratulations to our winners. Uh, really well done. And what I've put up here is where you can find everybody. This is us. These are the people who've been talking to you tonight and sharing all this fabulous expertise. So I want to say a huge thank you to Ruth, to Christine, to Claire, for joining us tonight. It's been a great session. Thanks to you for being so lively in the chat and sharing all your questions. Um, you can see on here that you've got the um, various websites and social media. If you'd like to receive a copy of the recording, um, you can do so by signing up to my mailing list via the address here. You'll also be getting an email tomorrow um, 
uh, I think it will come via Eventbrite, but it's from us, again, with the link for you to sign up if you'd like to get the recording, because I know we put a lot of it in the chat, but I bet you want to know about those sex toys. So we will make sure that you get to see them. So uh, I have really hope, I can see there's some really nice comments in the chat. So I'm really, really glad that you enjoyed it all. Um, thank you all very much for joining. Um, big goodbye from me. Um, Goodbye from all the panel and have a great evening, everybody. Thank you. Well done, ladies. Thank you very much. That was absolutely.